22 years since I came. In this time, I have seen a ship never. But I remember the sea on my face, in my hand Polish bread, cheese, and in my sack whiskey, a present for my cousin Tadeusz, my cousin in America. Between 1900 and 1917, eight million immigrants crossed the Atlantic to start a new life in America. In this new world, it was said, there was a chance for everyone to succeed, to prosper, to live the American dream. But how far could America fulfill such expectations? This program reconstructs the testimonies of four immigrants who came to America in the early years of the 20th century. Their words survive because in the late 1930s they were interviewed by the Federal Writers Project, an oral history project paid for by the U.S. government. 10,000 Americans were interviewed in all. Their lives, their experiences written down filed away in the Library of Congress. 10,000 American voices. You like to see pictures of old country? Yes. This my father, mother. What color dress is dark, very dark. One day I am with my mother. We get letter from America, from Tadeusz. He say he is married, he has good job, plenty eat. He and his wife, they have a room all their own. They are glad. I say to my mother, I am going to America. And she say, you go to America, you find the money. All day long I work in garden. Everywhere beets and cabbages, beets and cabbages. Too much, too young. Me just 15 years. But me get money. Me come to America. The year Catherine Corona left Poland, 1916, Europe was tearing itself to pieces. The old empires of Britain, Germany, France, Russia, bogged down in the mutual slaughter of the First World War. The immigrants that arrived in America turned their backs on this old world. They fled the poverty of peasant life. They fled a world governed by class, stifling opportunity. Many fled religious or political persecution. Hermann Kirschbaum was a Russian Jew from Courland in what's now Latvia. When I was 15, I ran away from home. Took some money from my father's desk, ran away. <laughs> I had no passport, but in Europe, with money, you can do anything. I got a boat to London. I met this English Jew. He said, America's the place. You see, I had no trade. At that time, in Europe, no Jew was allowed to learn a trade. All over Europe, it was the same. He said, in America, you can learn a trade. So this London Jew and I, we came together. I had money, but no language. He had no money, but he knew the ropes. He knew his onions, you know. I bought his ticket. We landed in New York. This is 1912. Oh, the first thing we saw was the statue, you know, in the harbor. <laughs> I mean, liberty, you know. It's hard to understand if you're born here, but I came from Greece. I came with bright hopes. I came with love of liberty. I don't look back. What did Greece give to me? <laughs> Nothing. 
What did America give to me? Puh, everything. The words of a Greek restaurateur, Tony. We don't know his surname. His testimony gives few details of his arrival. But most immigrants from Europe were processed here, at Ellis Island, just off Manhattan. They'd pass under the watchful eye of medical officers, alert for mental or physical illnesses. There were confusing forms to fill in, 29 questions on their status and prospects. But that was nothing compared to what was to come. Next stop, New York. As bewildering then as it remains today. Miguel Santos, an optician from Cuba, saw New York first in 1904. I am looking at this electric streetcar and I am thinking, how can he move without horses? I go to the museums, I go to the aquarium, I hear Caruso sing at the Grand Opera. I see so many things. The Flatiron Building and the Brooklyn Bridge and the subway and down at City Hall, the rush hour. One thing I do not like is I cannot sleep because of the sound of the elevators. The noise, always the noise. To get used to it. I thought New York was the best city in the world. I still do. I walked into this restaurant on Rivington Street. It's on the corner of Eldridge. I remember it as well as yesterday. I, I should drop down dead if I didn't, for 15 cents, buy a four or five course meal. I had soup, a big meat order, and good, and dessert, tea, coffee, and on top of that, they gave you a big soda, you know, from the soda fountain, free. And if you give the waiter a nickel tip every week, he's your friend for life. <laughs> So what was this place, America, to which they'd come? It was still a new nation, little over a century old, but it was modern, confident, prosperous. It was rich in raw materials. It exported wheat grown in vast quantities in the Midwest. It exported iron and steel. It invited new immigrants to share in this prosperity, to take a job, to pull your way up in the world. It was just a question of finding your feet. Hermann Kirschbaum settled in what he called the Jewish ghetto on the Lower East Side. It's around Seward's Park, you know, and a little further down, plenty of Jews there. I thought I'd never seen so many Jews. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I never had. And friendly. Eh. So, anyway. Hmm. My money runs out. I have to start working. I, uh, I sold shoelaces for a while. Then I got a chance to learn the fur business. I jumped at it. Within two years, I was earning 50 or $60 per week. From shoelaces to half a hundred per. Pretty good, eh? <laughs> It, uh, it went a little to my head. When I came here in my teens, you know, I'm uh, handicapped, not knowing the language. Anyway, uh, I'm working in a hot cleaning parlor. Uh, this, cust <laughs> this customer says to me, he says, uh, <clears throat> how would I like to learn the restaurant business? So, that's what I do. And I'm mingling with the customers and I'm uh, learning, you know. And when the time come to marry, I marry an American girl. Hmm. I couldn't fall in love with a girl from the old country because uh, she would not be modernized, you know. It's uh, relative, you know. Uh, 
people from my country say I, I made a success in business. They have envy. Yeah, I believe anyone, you know, uh, using a little common sense, learning from your mistakes, uh, if you have courage and you want to work, that this is a country where anyone can make good. A country where anyone can make good. Was it true? In these New York tenements, immigrants lived in cramped conditions. There was hardship here. The archive pictures sometimes gloss over. The files of the Federal Writers Project contain stories of immigrants in sweatshops, dying of dust poisoning in attic rooms. No two experiences were the same. For Catherine Corona, New York was just a stopover. Her cousin, Tadeusz, lived in the industrial town of Manchester, New Hampshire. Her testimony recalls the journey north, frightened, bewildered, a peasant girl in a strange and alien land. You see, on my ship, everyone different. So many language. But now, Everyone American. Everyone speak American. All dressed the same. Only I am different. And then we come to Manchester. I look. No Polish costume do I see. But then I'm being held and kissed by these people. They speak Polish, but they do not look Polish at all. And they laugh and they tease me about my old country clothes. So the next day, nothing else will do. Goodbye to my skirts and petticoats, my bright kerchiefs, my jacket with the embroidery, you know. I send them to my sister back home. They are gone. I dress now, American. But when I see Tadeusz, I hide. I feel undressed, naked, in these so few American clothes. Tadeusz had arranged for Catherine to work here, in the Amishkeg textile mills. She worked alongside American women of French and Irish origin. Quite a contrast from gathering beets in some Polish field. I stand by the loom. I watch for broken threads. I am so proud. I sing, I laugh. Me, me, I have job in America. I send dollars home. Five American dollars for my mother. But her testimony begs a question. Was it really so easy to leave your old culture behind, to discard your past like a set of old clothes? America's president, Woodrow Wilson, hoped so. For him, America wasn't just some bolt hole from Europe. It was a nation in its own right, with its own identity and culture. But that culture was the culture of the old establishment. White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. People like him. And the new waves of immigrants, mostly from southern or eastern Europe, struggled not to feel like outsiders, struggled to be accepted. I spent there two years on the same loom. And always a little trouble here, a little trouble there. There is a girl next to me, she does not like to see me happy. She says something I cannot understand. The others look at me and laugh. One day she trips me and I fall. I break my finger, my food is fallen on the floor. Ay, ay, Polander. Ay, ay, Polander. 
I have no lunch that day. I have dignity. I will not eat the food from the floor. Sure, sure, yeah, I had trouble like that once. Um, I was on a streetcar uh, not long after I arrived. Uh, I was looking out the window. Uh, I saw some schoolboys. Maybe I look funny to them, I don't know. Anyway, one of them had a, a rock. Uh, he throws it through the window. It's uh, a deep cut, you know, it bled pretty bad. Yeah, yeah I'm so excited to be in America. It made me feel uh, a little unwelcome. But that was a long time ago. It seems America wasn't always as welcoming as people hoped. And so the American melting pot became a kind of simmering stew. Different cultures keeping apart through pride, but also through self-protection. Do you want to know the truth? The word liberty is very much heard in the land of Uncle Sam. So how come when we come here, we have to stick together because of the hatred Americans feel toward us? They get drunk, they pick a quarrel. I said to one of them, why you talk to me in this contemptuous way? And he's closing his hand to threaten me. So I am throwing the first uh, chin bombasi, you know, punch. And this policeman, he comes to arrest me. And you talk about democracy. You talk about the rights of man. In Manchester, the Polish community remains strong. In the Polish church, where Catherine married her Polish husband, they still worship in the native tongue. It was a balancing act, becoming American while keeping your own culture intact. Today is exciting. I go to courthouse for papers, final papers. Now I become citizen, you understand? Months I study who makes laws in the country, who makes laws in the state, what is name of president of America. Why do you wish to become American citizen? I have answer ready to hear my children say, of course my mother, she votes, she is American citizen. But, uh, sh secret, I not say this. Also, I wish to become citizen to join the Polish American Citizen Club. We go to dances, we march, we wear uniform, beautiful uniform. Cape red, gloves white, and a badge as large as a silver dollar. In 1917, Woodrow Wilson attempted to unify this simmering stew of cultures in a patriotic crusade, joining Britain and France in the war against Germany. For two years, the United States had grown rich trading with the Allies, sustaining their war effort. When Germany threatened this prosperity, the delusion of American neutrality sank. The call to arms challenged all Americans, immigrants included. When the war broke out, sure, I joined up. I joined the Navy. I saw some fighting. <laughs> My friends, <laughs> they told me I was crazy. Yeah. But uh, no, I was proud to wear the uniform. And when I think about it today, I'm still proud that I fought for my country, you know, uh, for its ideals. For my country. 
America. In the stalemate of the trenches, the arrival of the Americans was decisive. Two million fresh troops helped the Allies push the Germans back. With victory came questions for the future. What now was America's role on the world stage? Wilson called for a League of Nations, an international peacekeeping force in which America would take the lead. But the American Senate rejected the League, killing Wilson's dream. Too much American blood had been spilled already fighting Europe's war. Let Europe now sort out her own problems. It was an attitude some recent immigrants found easy to understand. You know, I tell you about that Jew I met in London. We came over together, joined up, got himself killed in France, poor fellow. My parents lost everything. They had to leave Courland. They escaped to Antwerp in Belgium. And I'm here on $60 a week in the best city in the world. I'm wearing expensive clothes. I'm smoking the best cigars. What should I think? I ran away from all that. From 1918 to 1924, another million immigrants arrived at Ellis Island. But America was closing the door, limiting the flood of un-American people, un-American ideas. They imposed literacy tests, quotas. Meanwhile, those who'd already arrived learned in their turn what it meant to be American. Nations within a nation. And tonight, I will go to dance with my husband. I will drink beer, eat the little fish we make of pretzel dough. The sausage is good. And I will watch the men behind the bar, how they are moving, moving. Never collide with patrons, with each other. Never do they drop a tray, a drink. And I watch it all, and I love it. This is freedom. This is America. Everybody glad. <laughs> <laughs> 